So I'm uh, Tim Shacker from the University of Minnesota and have, will be chairing this session. This is a session on reservoirs, and as I looked over the schedule for the entire meeting, um, you know, we're, you're here ta today, uh, for this meeting talking about how to intervene to stop the virus from spreading, how to prevent the virus uh, from spreading um, with uh, various preventive therapies and things like that. But it all comes back down to the basic science of what is the virus doing in the tissues? So the, the reservoir, how is it established? How is it maintained? And despite all of the work that's been happening in this field for many years, and I'm talking about reservoir work, there's still a lot we don't understand. And I think that the, those um, deficits in our, in our knowledge are really well highlighted by the presentations that you're going to be seeing today. You're going to be uh, looking at some data to talk about where is the reservoir, how is it established, what kind of interventions do we need to do to try and reduce the reservoir. So these are really, really interesting presentations. And what I'd like to do is just have everybody present their data, and then they'll come up and we can have a conversation. You can ask questions about the data, um, et cetera. The next presenter is Dr. Laufer. Um, uh, from the uh, medical school in Buenos Aires University. Um, the presentation is HCV treatment with direct acting antivirals in HIV HCV co-infected subjects affects the dynamics of the HIV-1 reservoir. Um, hello to everybody. Uh, thanks for the scientific committee for letting us show our work. That has been done in collaboration between our institute, the Imbus Institute in Argentina, and the Peter Doherty Institute and the Melbourne Uni University in Sydney. As you all know, uh, HIV infection cannot be cured or we cannot access to remission because, despite of successful antiretroviral therapy, because of the presence of latently infected cells uh, known as reservoirs. How uh, other co-infections impact or modify these reservoirs is still unknown. Specifically, we want to know the impact of hepatitis C infection and the impact also of the cure of hepatitis C infection with direct antiviral agents on HIV reservoirs. Our hypothesis was that after HCV cure, the persistent signaling of interferon will be modified and that will impact in the, in the frequency of infected cells and also in the basal transcriptional activity. To evaluate that, we included 19 HIV-HCV co-infected individuals uh, they were all diagnosed with, with cirrhosis, either by uh, with liver biopsy or uh, transient elastography. They, as you can see, they all have a very long history of both HIV and H hepatitis C infection. They were under successful antiretroviral therapy, all of them with integrized inhibitors. Uh, most of the patients had genotype, uh, hepatitis C genotype infection. They all received sofosbuvir and daclatasvir uh, treatment for the hepatitis C. The addition of ribavirin was, uh, it was depending on HCV genotype and if the patient can tolerate the ribavirin. <coughs> the treatment was 12 or, or 12, 12 or 24 weeks, depending on the addition of ribavirin and also of the genotype. Most of them were males, and the median age was 49 years. Um, we take samples before the initiation of VA treatment, at the end of the treatment, and 12 months after I stop the treatment. As you can see, patients re exhibit at baseline, the median CD4 count was around 300. They don't, we did not find any statistical significant difference in the median now, um, count of CD4 at end of treatment or 12 months post treatment, neither in CD4 T cell count nor in CD80 cells. But because of the changes they exhibit, we can see that there was a higher relations ratio of CD4, CD8 and the end of treatment compared with baseline. This difference was not maintained at the one year sample. To evaluate HIV, and, excuse me, <laughs> uh, to evaluate HIV reservoirs, we we separate PBMC from uh, every sample. 
we have the result from baseline and then of treatment. We are evaluating the one year after treatment samples. And after we se separate the PBMC, we separate also CD4 cell, CD4 cell, and that's where we found, we measure the total integrate uh, DNA, HIV DNA, and also the different forms of, of HIV RNA. As you can see in this slide, there was no difference between both samples in the integrate HIV DNA, and there was also no difference in the multiple splice RNA. But when we evaluate unsplice DNA, that is a form to evaluate the transcriptional ratio of these cells, of these latently infected cells, we can see that there is a difference between baseline and end of treatment. And also there is a tendency to a higher ratio of unsplice RNA versus unsplice multiple splice RNA. And this is a way to measure uh, cells that har harbor uh, HIV virus in the later stage of life cycle. We also wanted to compare between patients that do not have a hepatitis C infection, and that's why we include a cohort of HIV mono-infected patients. When we can see at, that there is a tendency to higher levels of unsplice RNA in co-infected patients at baseline, but there is a significant difference with a p-value of less than 0 0.01 between HIV mono-infected patients and patients who cure HIV a hepatitis C infection. Uh, in conclusion, we can say that there is a higher, higher levels of unsplice RNA in HIV, HCV co-infected patients. This re these levels are even higher after the cure of, of hepatitis C. And what we think is that our hypothesis is correct, that interferon signaling is reduced after the elimination of hepatitis C, and this increased the transcriptional uh, baseline activity of latently infected cells, and increased the, 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 that's why we can see the increase in the RNA in, in infected cells. This has to be a, uh, complete this study with the one-year sample and to see what happened with the total DNA once these cells express more splice RNA and if carry this conduce to an elimination of these cells or an increase in the total integration of DNA. And we will have these results in, in a few months. We would like to thank all the patients to agree to participate in this study. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation will be from uh, Dr. John Thornhill from MRC and the Imperial College in London. Uh, he'll be continuing our discussion about the uh, uh, um, B cell follicles by looking at follicular CD8 T cells in gut associated lymphoid tissue are associated with lower <laughs> HIV1 reservoir in the terminal ileum after ART initiated during primary HIV infection. John? Uh, good afternoon, and um, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present these data. So I've noticed closures. So the B cell follicle, as has been previously discussed, is a site of potential ongoing viral replication during treated HIV infection. And more recently, uh, follicular cytotoxic CD8 T cells have been shown to have the ability to migrate to the B-cell follicle, and they may be important for HIV control. So in this um, immunohistochemistry section, uh, B-cell 6 as a uh, germinal center marker is in brown, and uh, CD8 is in red. And you can see that there are a uh, few CD8 cells with it within the germinal center. I'm highlighting one here. So we, um, in this study, wanted to examine the presence of follicular CD8 cells in gut-associated lymphoid tissue and look for associations between these cells and, and HIV DNA. So to do that, um, we used a, uh, the HEATHER study, which is an observational study of treated primary HIV infection. And we also recruited controls, and these were individuals who were undergoing routine endoscopy um, the primary infection cohort initiated an antiretrovirals within three months of their diagnosis of primary HIV infection. And for both groups, um, they underwent colonoscopy. They had concurrent sampling from the terminal ileum, from the rectum, and also from peripheral blood. 
Um, in terms of the clinical characteristics of the cohort, uh, there were 21 individuals in the primary infection cohort, all were male. Um, in contrast, uh, the majority of the individuals in, of, of the controls were female. Um, the median age was also older in the control cohort at 60 uh, compared to 35 in the primary infection cohort. Also, just to point out, the median time on antiretroviral therapy at the time of their gut biopsy in the primary infection cohort was 34 months. Um, follicular CD8 cells were defined as uh, CXCR5 positive, and this is a representative flow plot from, from rectal tissue, uh, illustrating the follicular CD8 population and the non-follicular CD8 population. So we uh, first compared uh, the frequency of CD8 cells that were CXCR5 positive, or, or follicular CD8s, uh, between uh, HIV positive individuals and controls. And we looked in the terminal ileum, which is in blue, uh, in the rectum in, or, sorry, terminal ileum in, in red, uh, the rectum in blue, and uh, PBMCs in yellow. And we found significantly higher uh, follicular CD8s in the rectal tissue of uh, HIV-infected individuals compared to controls, with no significant difference uh, in any of the other sites. Uh, we also confirmed the presence of CD8 cells within the B-cell follicle, again in, uh, in this immunohistochemistry section, which is, which is taken from rectal tissue for one of the participants. You have BCL6 staining in, in brown and uh, CD8 staining in, in red. Ten individuals in the primary infection cohort had longitudinal biopsies uh, taken approximately one year apart. Um, and between biopsy one and two, we found no uh, significant difference in the frequency of follicular CD8 cells in either the terminal ileum or the rectum. <coughs> we next looked at the phenotype of the follicular uh, CD8 cells compared to the non-follicular CD8 cells. So the follicular CD8 cells here are the, the uh, filled symbols and non-follicular in the open symbols. Um, and first, with, with BCL6, we found higher BCL6 expression in both the terminal ileum and the rectum. And similarly, for perforin and for granzyme B, we found a higher uh, uh, expression of perforin and granzyme B in the follicular CD8 cells compared to non-follicular CD8 cells in both the terminal ileum and the rectum. Finally, uh, we examined for an association between the frequency of follicular CD8 cells and HIV DNA. Um, in the terminal ileum, we found an inverse correlation between uh, CXCR5 expression on CD8 cells and HIV DNA, and we didn't find any significant association in rectal tissue. So in conclusion, uh, follicular CD8 cells are present and persist in gold on antiretroviral therapy. They exhibit greater cytotoxic potential than non-follicular CD8 cells, and they may have a role in limiting HIV reservoir in terminal ileum gold during treated primary infection. I'd like to thank all the Heather study participants and uh, my PhD supervisors, uh, John Fraser and Sarah Fiddler. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Ponte from uh, Montreal, and she'll be talking about HIV-1 reservoir diversity and genetic compartmentalization in blood and testes. Thank you, and I thank the organizers. I'm glad to present our data today on HIV-1 reservoir in testes. And I'm sorry, but I have to mention that I think this uh, talk really fits with the title of this session of kicking the reservoir where it hurts. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I want to mention that uh, this study is co-authored by Rachel Miller from Dr. Zabrina Brume's lab. So our current knowledge of HIV diversity in treated people in tissues remains incomplete, especially in tissues with immune privilege. The opportunity to study uh, human testicular tissues comes from a very unique cohort established by Dr. Jean-Pierre Routy at McGill University. So far, we have enrolled 10 HIV-positive participants who were suppressed on art for at least, at least six months prior to have a gender affirmation surgery from male to female, and they choose to donate their right and left testes on the day of surgery, as well as PBMCs. So to study HIV-1 diversity and assess potential genetic compartmentalization between those samples, we first extracted DNA from those samples to perform a single genome amplification step 
specific for the virus, followed by sequencing and then phylogenetic analysis. The results are displayed here as a phylogenetic tree. So we were able to isolate a total of 279 intact sequences from PBMCs and 182 intact sequences were isolated from both the right and left testes. So as you wonder what is this image, let me guide you through this donor. Uh, so, yeah. As you can see, we retrieved a multiple identical sequences in uh, both the right and left testes, whereas we see a lot more diversity in blood for this donor. And we can see that the sequences in blood are distinct than the one that were isolated from the testes. If we look at this donor, we can see a totally different picture where more diversity is seen in both the blood and the tissues. And if we look at this donor here, uh, maybe you cannot see clearly, but we uh, identified uh, identical sequences in blood and in both right and left testes. <laughs> so actually two conclusions uh, can be uh, drawn from those results. First, in half the study participants, we, uh, sh we showed evidence of HIV-1 genetic compartmentalization between blood and testes, meaning that eradication strategies need to consider the presence of a um, diverse HIV-1 reservoir in testes that can in, in some cases be different than the one in blood. And second conclusion, the fact that we found identical sequences in PBMCs and both testes is consistent with the migration of clonally expanded infected cells throughout the body, including into immune privileged sites. Then we investigated the correlates of latent HIV diversity in PBMCs. And we found that the diversity in blood is correlated with the one in testes. Also, the larger the reservoir, the more diverse it tends to be. We found a negative correlation with, uh, between HIV diversity in blood and the proportion of CD4 T cells, and a strong positive correlation with immune activation as uh, measured by the co-expression of HLADR and CD38 on CD4 T cells. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I thank all the collaborators of this study. Thank you. Um, the last presenter prior to the discussion um, will be Dr. Nathan Cummins from the Mayo Clinic uh, in Minnesota. And he's going to be talking about Ixazimib reduces HIV-1 reservoir size in a CASP-8P41 uh, dependent manner. Nathan? All right. Thank you, Tim, and uh, good afternoon. I want to start by thanking the participants of our research study for their uh, generous and selfless participation in our research and to the conference organizers for the opportunity to present today. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, HIV-1 protease is expressed in not only productively infected cells, but also in infected cells that are reactivated from latency. HIV-1 protease is able to cleave a cellular regulator of apoptosis called procaspase 8 to generate a novel uh, cleavage fragment that we uh, term caspase 8 p41, which is able in some circumstances to induce mitochondrial dependent apoptosis in infected cells. Uh, however, we have previously shown that caspase 8 p41 can also be bound and inactivated by the anti apoptotic protein BCL2. In these studies, we question what happened to that p41 BCL2 complex once they were bound. Without going into a lot of details due to lack of time, in co-transfection studies in 293T cells, we show that caspase 8 p41 and BCL2 complex together ends up polyubiquitinated and targeted for proteasomal degradation. It follows then that treatment of in cells that express caspase 8 p41 
with a proteasome inhibitor, including exazomib. Exazomib is an FDA-approved oral available proteasome inhibitor with minimal side effects. Increases caspase 8P41 expression by up to two and a half or threefold. And here I show data in JERCAT cells transfected with P41. We've seen the same in primary infected CD4 T cells. Separately and independently, treatment of cells uh, with proteasome inhibitors can induce HIV LTR transcription and reactivation in a number of latency models in an NF kappa B dependent manner. Therefore, with one drug, we have both the kick in inducing HIV transcription and the kill in increasing the expression of a pro-apoptotic protein specifically in infected cells. It follows then that when we treat co-cultures of mixed infected and uninfected cells, that the proteasome inhibitors induce preferential apoptosis in the infected cells compared to the uninfected cells. And here I show data in mixed cultures of JERCATs and uh, chronically infected JLAT cells. We have seen uh, similar data in primary uh, infected CD4 T cells. Finally, treatment of ex vivo CD4 T cells from ART suppressed patients with a single dose of exazomib along with concomitant ART reduces significantly both total and HIV-1, uh, uh, total and integrated HIV-1 DNA. So in summary, our model is that upon viral replication, uh, HIV protease is expressed. It cleaves procaspase 8 to generate caspase 8 P41, which is the green oval in this slide. In some circumstances, that can be bound and inactivated by BCL2. The addition of a proteasome inhibitor and not only induces more viral replication, but uh, also causes accumulation of caspase 8 P41, is able to overcome BCL2 restriction and induce apoptosis specifically in the infected cell. Based on these studies, we are now uh, conducting a pilot clinical trial in ART suppressed patients where we give six months of oral exazomib in a dose escalating fashion across cohorts uh, in conjunction with continued antiretroviral therapy. To date, we've enrolled 11 out of 17 participants. We've identified no serious adverse events in the low dose cohorts, uh, starting at one, two, and three milligram. Our full dose cohort cohort is enrolling now at four milligrams. Uh, we are measuring HIV reservoir size before treatment and after treatment in peripheral CD4 of T cells by digital droplet PCR and limiting dilution co-culture assay, and we will report those results at a later date. Here are my acknowledgments. I want to uh, especially acknowledge my friend and mentor, Andrew Badley, who's here in the audience the number of collaborators both at Mayo and outside of uh, Mayo, the clinical trial team, and our uh, voluntary DSMB members and uh, uh, funders of this research. Look forward to the questions during the panel discussion. Thank you. If we could have all the presenters come up and take your name tag and have a seat. Yeah. So I, we'll open it for discussion and questions, and let's just get started. This isn't on. Is it on? Is the mic on here? Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sarah Joseph, UNC Chapel Hill. It's a question for Dr. Ponte. Um, did you examine whether or not any of these patients had a history of STIs that may have contributed to the migration of T cells into the testes? Um, so our data on those patients are very limited. Um, but they are excluded from the study if they had previous history of STI, recent history of STIs. So that's diagnosed or? Uh, with, with the question of the STIs, these are by history or they were diagnosed or they were screened and excluded? With the or? medical um, records. And I, I have one actual question as well about that. Do you think that the... Most of the, or these patients, I'm sure, were on high-dose estrogen for a uh, period of time beforehand. Yes. Would mm -hmm. that, is there any reason to think that that would somehow influence the results? Um, so they are off uh, hormonal therapy uh, for a period of time, I think three months prior to the surgery. Um, we've performed some study of the testicular tissue to see whether we could see an impact. Uh, of the hormones, and in some participants, when they, they, they have been treated for a long time, we, we do see something on the mi microarchitecture. 
I don't know if that okay. can influence the migration of the virus or... Question. Hi, Francois Clavel from Paris. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Cummins first. Uh, the, um, the HIV protease, in order to be functional, needs to dimerize. This dimerization occurs as part of the dimerization of the whole GAGPO precursor and is readily uh, transported to the uh, plasma membrane through interaction with uh, uh, polar um, uh, lipids. I, is that, so it, it really, that, that GAGPO precursor is, is very quickly exported to the, uh, to the outside, of the budding site of the virus, and then only does the protease become active. And there's been a number of experiments showing that if you make a protease active too early, before that process of migration to the surface, to the bug site, occurs, then the, you cleave your gag pole, uh, too early and then uh, production of virus fails. How do you reconcile those findings with yours that seem to suggest that an active protease, dimeric, functional, is, is floating around wherever the, uh, the caspase might be? Is this on? Uh, is this on? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question. It's a very good question, and it's one that we've actually faced a number of times because I believe the dogma in the field is as you described it. But there are a number of uh, papers uh, in the mid '90s which actually show that uh, protease is active in the cytoplasm, and there are a number of other papers that show that other degenerate sub uh, specificity to the activity. So it can cleave a number of other cellular proteins within the cytosol, not just procaspase eight. Uh, those yeah, there include was enough B at some point, but mm -hmm. yeah, but vimentin, uh, actin, BCL2, <coughs> a number of uh, cytosolic proteins have been described to be cleaved. So I think there's supporting evidence uh, to both sides of the story uh, that uh, protease is active within the cytosol. Okay, so I have also a question for Dr. Ponte. Uh, the uh, it's unclear to me. Uh, I didn't see well. Uh, what kind of difference you found between the two testis, testicles of, of those donors? Uh, did you see those clonal expansions in one and not the other? Did you see strong differences between the two testicles? And did you even try to uh, sample uh, tissue from one region of the testicle and from another one, and did you see differences there? So to answer the first part, um, well, everyone is unique, basically. Uh, in some cases, we found evidence of um, different virus from one testis to the other. Uh, in some cases, we found uh, identical sequences in both and not in blood. And in some cases, we found the same sequence uh, in blood and in both tissues. Um, the second part, uh, we did sample the tissues. So those data comes from uh, one to two parts of two pieces of tissue. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know whether it, it's a good question. It's something we need to do actually to we see whether the region of the tissue will show different results. I, I'm just wondering how, how special uh, testicles are in terms of HIV diversity. Yes, there are some sort of places where all the immune cells don't go because you don't want to destroy your germ cells. That's that, fine. I'm not sure uh, that's true. Yeah. Sorry. But, <laughs> well, but if, if you looked at spleen, if you looked at liver, would mm. you see the same kind of things? Well, don't, don't deprive somebody of his liver. It's, it's bad. Testicle is bad too, but yeah, I don't that's know. my macho point yeah. of view. <laughs> All right, thank you. Question over here. Lisa Chakrabarty, Paris. I had a question for Mirko, great presentation. You, you actually said that there was, IL-10 was expressed in 80% of DNA, HIV DNA positive cells, which would make it, uh, if I understood correctly, does this apply to latent cells? in the lymph nodes and in the blood? Thank you. So two things. One, we don't know, and 
team may correct me. Uh, so Jay Corris tell me we don't know if those are cells that express L10 or cells that have binded L10 expressed by other cells. We cannot say directly by the staining. Is very well around the cells, so my guessing and Jay guess is more cells that express, but we don't know for sure, so it can be mixed. A two that was a colocalization with cells that express SV DNA, so a large fraction of those will not be, I think, replication competent. So we are now trying to do more direct measure, but that was 80% of the cells expressing SVDNA on antiretroviral therapy are also L10 positive. Can you comment, Mirko, on the really striking finding of the, the localization of this, even untreated infection in the B-cell follicle, uh, and a real decrease in expression uh, in the tissue? Yeah, so m many cells express IL-10, and I didn't have time to show, but uh, uh, we've done also that staining by IL-10 and also several marker of phenotypical marker for different cells. So B cells, macrophages express a lot of IL-10, but B cells also express a lot of IL-10. T follicular cells express also IL-10. So one main hypothesis we are following is that, uh, and this is supported by, as you said, the B cell follicle localization, is that uh, during the interaction between B cells and TFA cells, IL-10 is one of the molecules important for the survival of T follicular cells, including the ones that are infected. This is happening in vitro, we have data, and now we're trying to see if it's the same in vivo. But you, you don't see an increased expression by IL-10 in uninfected people? In uh, uninfected people is, uh, yeah, I think it's actually more in the medulla record, if I remember correctly, in human, yeah. I have a question for Mirko Fajardini as well. I was wondering whether you looked at signs of inflammation when you treated the animals with anti-IL-10, since it's an anti-inflammatory yeah. molecule, and if you treat longer with IL-10, whether you expect to have some opposite effect on the reservoir on, or the quality of the immune responses? Yeah. So no, this is a very important point. Actually, we had, um, it took a long time for us to do this study because it was a, it's a quite difficult concept to block a potential anti-inflammatory cytokine in the context of HIV infection. So this is why this actually was done with AR21 because we want to prove that it is safe and the antibody was working. So we are doing a lot of analysis for safety. Until now, everything we measure in blood, including um, chemical parameter and uh, immunological parameter or in lymph node, we do not see any sign of inflammation. But the most uh, uh, relevant thing is going to be in the gut because at least in the mouse model blocking more the L10 receptor than L10, but blocking L10 receptor induce um, colitis. So we are, again, in collaboration with Jake and also many other measures by flucytometry, we are uh, analyzing the gut to see if we induce any inflammation. For the measure we have now, it doesn't seem, but uh, we still need to do many other measures. Hi, I have two questions for Natalia. So first of all, congratulations for your interesting results on, on co-infection and HIV reservoir. The first one is that all your co-infected patients have F4 yes. fibrosis, so all of them have cirrhosis. Yes. Do you think your results will apply to the general population of co-infected patients independently of the stage of fibrosis? No, we, maybe it's something just related to this population because uh -huh. they have some particular char characteristics. Uh, we are now including more F4, but also other patients with different degrees of liver fibrosis. The reason why we include these patients was because in Argentina we have, a, uh, when we do the study, very hard, difficult to get access yeah. to hepatitis know, treatment, and it was all, it was limited to F4 yeah, patients. It's the same in Spain. Uh, yes, but that, it, it was something bad in a way, but it was good in, in another way because the population was very homogeneous, so. Okay. The other question is, um, so in the short term, your data suggests that the, 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 the impact of eradicating HCV uh, is negative on the HIV reservoir. <coughs> Do you think the same will uh, be obtained in the long term? No, it's, we can also we can see it in two ways. The transcriptional activity is increased. Uh -huh. It's the same that happens with agents that uh, revert latency. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. this is a way that we can have these cells eliminated mm -hmm. by the immune system. So mm -hmm. maybe it's a good thing. Uh, but in the other way, it can be that these cells that replicate increase the reservoir size. That's why we are waiting for the one-year sample yeah. to see whether it's something transient that will 
in the one year sample will not see again. Uh, and, yeah. and what do you think is the mechanism behind this effect? Well, we think, I said it was proved that the interference signaling was mm -hmm. reduced, but it's not proved. We have to do another <laughs> test to prove that. Uh, that's our hypothesis, that after we clear hepatitis C, the stimulus is gone, so mm -hmm. the dec there is a decrease in the production of interferon that it's also a way that the transcriptional activity of, hepat uh, of HIV is controlled. So mm -hmm. after interferon is reduced and the uh, stimulated genes of interferons are reduced, that's why HIV can increase, increase its activity activity. of okay. the, its transcriptional activity also in latently infected cells, okay. and that's why we, we think we see this, this phenomenon. Okay, thank you. Raj Gandhi from Mass General. This is a question for the first speaker on the immunogenetics of post-treatment control. Uh, kind of two questions. One is um, you showed us data suggesting that NK cells may be important, less so T cells. Do you have any functional data or any other data beyond the genetics to support that? And then the second unrelated question is do any of these post-treatment controllers go on to lose control? Lose control? Have you Showing us data on that. Yeah, so um, about the first question, yes, I didn't have the time, but we have uh, phenotypical and functional data. So in difference in post treatment controllers, um, basically the NK cells from post treatment controllers are able to better uh, suppress infection in, in co culture with uh, uh, CD40 cells. And they are also have better capacity to produce uh, uh, interferon gamma. And uh, they have higher expression of uh, some KIRS and NKG2A. And uh, basically, very low. Uh, uh, levels of activation, and yeah, I, I was not able to to, to show that, but uh, I, I will be showing some of, of this data on Thursday. And regarding the the control of uh, the loss of control, yes, some of post treatment controllers are going to lose control uh, of uh, of infection, and actually, Laurent Uclou will be presenting uh, this data tomorrow. And uh, well, I, I don't want to spoil <laughs> to spoil the presentation, but uh, yeah, th there is a difference also in in how uh, perhaps something that he will not be presenting. Uh, something that we observe is that the HLA-B35 are going to be able to maintain very nice control, but then uh, once uh, they start having some um, uh, detect well, detectable viremia, they immediately lose control. They are unable to; they are not able to to maintain uh, low-level uh, control of viremia compared to the to the other posthuman controllers, who are, are able to maintain some uh, low-level viremia before they definitely uh, lose control. Hi, Santiago from Mexico. So question for Natalia, thank you for your presentation. Um, you present uh, differences in reservoir in co-infected patients and treated with the AAs, <coughs> but you report uh, this reservoir um, by per, per uh, million PBMCs, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have the data on CD40 cell counts and no. do you think it would affect that uh. result? We put the million PBMCs, but it's CD4. It's okay, it's so just for it's CD4. It's oh. yes, no, it's Thank CD4. you so much. No, it's and what's wrong? Quick question for Rosal Rosalie. Um, um, do you think you can extrapolate your data uh, of uh, this um, HIV sequencing in testes from trans uh, persons, uh, tra transgender uh, persons, to uh, non-transgender uh, male? Uh, subjects, since uh, transgender before going to surgery, uh, they are exposed to high doses of uh, uh, hormones, and these affect actually the the metabolism of um, of the testes. Uh, spermatogenesis is uh, stopped, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's a good question. Uh, we need controls, so if you want to volunteer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's true that the hormones, they can have um, an impact on immune activation. And so one, one uh, element that we do not have is the time of infection without art. Uh, maybe the fact that they take female hormones can have a consequence on immune activation, but this site is not supposed to be activated. So I would extrapolate. <laughs> okay, I have a question to Mirko. 
And the I2 producing cells, could, uh, is there, uh, uh, how many cells of these are potentially T-Rex, CD4, regulatory CD4 cells? And do you think these T-Rex are a sizable reservoir in your monkeys? Yes, so actually, if you remember the immunostochiamus staining, there was also a blue color that I did not comment on. So the green was L10, the red was the virus, the blues was uh, CTLA4, and a good fraction of TREG express L10. And again, it's expressed by many cells, but TREG definitely express. We, we published a paper on immunity in uh, the fall 2017 where we identified more specifically TREG and actually found that they contribute to viral persistence and largely in the T cell zone outside the follicle, so in addition to the T follicular per cells. So some of these cells are going to be Treg, and we are now going to analyze more in detail. Some of these may be also T follicular regulatory cells because if you remember, they are largely in the follicle. Okay. So I have a question for Dr. Thornhill. The, um, it, it seems like one of the um, unique reservoirs that is emerging um, is this whole idea that the, the B cell follicle can be an independent reservoir, not only of uh, uh, T follicular helper cells, but virus that's attached to the FTC network, et cetera. Um, you know, in, in our work, we've looked mostly in lymphatic or in lymph nodes, um, but Pam Skinner and others have shown that CD8s are, at least in lymph node, um, are excluded for the most part from the B cell follicle. And you're showing, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, in gut that in the follicular aggregates, particularly in the terminal ileum, that that may not be the case and that that might afford better control. But you also find higher numbers of these cells in rectal lymphoid aggregates as opposed to terminal ileum. I'm just wondering if you can comment on the idea that the B cell follicle is... Uh, a unique reservoir, but then square that idea that there are more of these cells in follicular aggregates in the rectum as opposed to the ileum, yet you seem to have better control in the ileum, if I'm yeah, remembering. Yeah, so is this on? Can you hear me? We, we did, um, we found a higher frequency of the of follicular CD8 in the rectum overall, um, and it was higher compared to controls, whereas compared to in the terminal ileum, compared to controls, it was, it was equivalent, actually. Um, but the terminal ileum is the site where we actually found an association with, with HIV DNA. So I don't know if there is, is something different about uh, where along the GI tract, whether you're having uh, p potentially other antigenic stimuli uh, ca causing expansion of follicular CD8s in the rectum, whereas you don't have that in the terminal ileum. But um, from our data, they appear to be more important for control in the terminal ileum. Do you think any of that could be sampling issue? Uh, that, that's a, a reasonable question. Um, one thing that we kind of goes against it is with the longitudinal sampling, we, we sound, found similar frequencies kind of one year apart. Um, so for the immunohistochemistry sections, there's definitely quite a bit of variability because we just take one biopsy and put that in formalin. But for the flow cytometry data, um, that's usually uh, combined biopsies of kind of eight biopsies that are then undergo collagenase digestion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Question. One quick question for Natalia. Um, I'm wondering if in your study there are, there are co-infected patients that failed in HCV clearance after the AAs. No, in our cohort, they all achieved sustained biological response. Oh, okay. Because if there are um, patients that failed, they they then they'll, they can serve as a negative control for the DAA's treatment because maybe DAA treatment alone caused the, like, Bigger yes. reservoir, yeah. Uh, as you know, there is a very, there only very few patients fail to, yeah, to yeah. therapy. So we have two, but we have to increase. Also, we are increasing the number of these patients because it was a very small population. So may we can see if these results are preserved when we increase the sample size. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, our, our, one more. Just a small clarification from Dr. Ponzi, so maybe I missed it, but you said you did amplification, uh, genome amplification. So is it full length genome amplification or I saw between bracket HIV-NEF? Yeah, it is NEF sequence. So 
doing all this extrapolation of identical sequence clonal expansion, do you think will it be applicable when you're gonna sequence the whole genome? Because I suppose your amplicon is what, 200, 300 nucleotide? Or I don't know. Um, I'm not sure about the size of, of the amplicon, but it's a very short uh, PCR. Yeah. And that's why actually we choose this region yeah. uh, because it's a hi highly sensitive. So in tissue like testis, it, uh, it fits well. And are you intending well, to um, sequence the whole thing or you don't have enough material? No, actually uh, we are starting, uh, Dr. Zabrina Brume is starting to have data showing that actu NEF is actually uh, representative of the whole genome, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Maybe small clarification also from Dr. Kuman. You, yeah, sorry. So you said that you use a proteasome inhibitor. Yes. And then you saw you attributed, you notice first a activation at the LTR, mm -hmm. then accumulation of caspase, and then you attributed this is why it's killing the infected mm -hmm. cells. But for example, when you incubated the jerked cells and a J light, mm -hmm. how do you know that it's not just activating the LTR and therefore producing virus, killing the cells, and therefore this is why they're dying, not really from the accumulation of caspase? No, that's, that's a great question. So um, the way we, I did not present the data here, I can share that with you in, in more detail, but we utilized a JERCAT uh, derivative uh, cell line called JB6 cells, which are deficient with procaspase 8. Okay. And in those cells, we then transfected in wild type procaspase 8 or a mutant procaspase 8, which is not cleavable by HIV protease. Okay. Uh, we then infected those cells with HIV and monitored uh, uh, apoptosis in P24 positive or P24 negative cells treated with or without exazomib. Okay. And so by doing that, we showed that the uh, effect of exazomib is abrogated with the cells transfected with the non-cleavable caspase 8. That That's where we have the uh, dependent sense. mechanism. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, well, we're out of time. Thank you very much for um, paying attention and coming to this meeting. Um, thank you. <laughs>